Okay, so neutrons are coming from uh, this building and they are going through this, um, this brown guide to the hatch. Our neutron has come down from the source inside the guide. Inside the guide are surfaces of mirrors, so if the neutron tries to stray out, it bounces back. Some neutrons are travelling faster, some are travelling slower, eventually emerging through this hole. Passes through a series of slits that chop down the beam, of which our neutron is just one part, eventually passing into the sample. In the sample, countless number of atoms, it will probably strike one of them. And when it does, it could move in any direction. Hopefully, it will pass into one of these detectors, one here, or on the other side. So the neutron will travel straight and then finally is detected uh, by a series of scintillators which will glow briefly. If we know the, the time it arrives, we know the wavelengths, we know the spacing between the atoms that the neutron has bounced off. And ultimately we can tell a lot about the material just from the positions of its atoms. This, the, that explains a lot of how the material behaves, how likely it is to become damaged in service. We do lots of uh, typical engineering components, uh, but we also have uh, uh, occasionally quite uh, interesting components, like a train wheel, which is, uh, for example, like 500 kilograms. Other interesting component will be an Airbus swing. We measure like real samples that actually serve a purpose, like in aeroplanes, automobiles, trains. We certainly had some very large samples in here. Uh, luckily we have a crane uh, to get them in. Uh, let's see, two tonnes or so uh, this will take. Uh, we once had uh, a massive uh, block of magnesium uh, that was actually cast from the factory and it turned out they actually saw absolutely nothing. We eventually learned it had small traces of gadolinium in the casting, uh, which is about or at least 100,000 times more absorbing than any other, other metal. We didn't know this was a problem at the time, but it was, it was very frustrating at the time. We eventually made another one that didn't have the gadolinium and it worked perfectly. If you were down at the size of the atom, you, firstly you would see the atoms are quite nicely arranged, like, like oranges stacked on a supermarket shelf. And it's the fact that they're in this pattern that actually allows this kind of experiment to be done. Because a, a single atom is too small for, for a technique like this to see, but the fact that they're arranged in a regular spacing means we can actually work out the average gap between a large number of atoms together. I found this very interesting actually because it is one of the best instruments in the world and uh, it is extremely powerful. Having 2,400 detectors on each side at 90 degree and plus um, 100 detectors on the transmission detector, this is not a piece of kit you can have it every day to play. So I, I really feel quite um, lucky to be here. You're, you're the size of an atom, you see a neutron come in and it will bounce it will miss most of the atoms, it will bounce off one or two. Um, but when it does bounce off one and then another, eventually enough neutrons have bounced off enough atoms for a pattern to form. And the pattern that you form uh, in the detectors is related to how the atoms were arranged. The possibility that we can help scientists from uh, archaeologists to uh, engineers which are designing new bridges, cars and power stations is quite rewarding. In a way, I'm thinking that we can do here a little difference.